We have another presentation coming up with Mark Valek. Mark is working for Incrementum AG from Liechtenstein, which is an asset management company. He's responsible for the portfolio management there and research. And since a long time, you're publishing a report um, called In Gold We Trust, which is like the annual Bible of the latest developments in gold. And you edit the crypto research report. And uh, you see it's, it's quite a heavy uh, piece of work. It is. And um, you will talk about um, digital and physical gold and how these two play together. Yes. All right. Please. Thanks, Moritz. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for having this uh, long endurance and uh, waiting for the, the big finale, the grand finale. I hope I can uh, meet the expectations. Um, yeah, Mark Valek is my name. Um, together with Ronnie, who is also here in the audience, uh, we, we uh, publish an annual publication which is called the In Gold We Trust Report. We've been doing this for many years actually already, since 2013 under the Incrementum brand. Uh, Ronnie actually started it even uh, earlier and since 2007 under the Erste Bank. And since we are such gold bugs, we actually were quite fortunate to, enough to also discover Bitcoin pretty soon. And contrary to other people from the gold space, we didn't like completely reject it. But I think from the economic point of view, we got it pretty fast what it actually is about. It's about to potentially create an alternative non-inflationary monetary system. That's what I would say at least. And we've been covering it also in our reports. Um, we've been looking at it, pr at it privately, but now since uh, now the newest developments from the regulatory side have made it possible for us, we are actually also um, uh, have started a, a fund, investment fund, which also is looking at this topic. But um, I'm not going to talk so much about the fund or anything like that, but I, I, what I want to give you today is like a brief, uh, some, some brief ideas how potentially to combine these topics, physical gold and digital gold, and how one can actually do pretty simple, but I think smart investment strategies around these topics, um, and I hope you can take something away from this. So, let's see if this works. Oops. Okay. So, this I just mentioned. Next report is coming out on uh, May 27th, and uh, we are looking forward to it already. It's just a hell of a work. It's 350 pages. It was last year, so I'm trying to convince Ronnie to make it a little bit more condensed this year. But uh, it's always a good read, I think. So, what I want to say generally, I want to give you a brief I make, want to make the case very briefly for investments in both of these asset class. So what is the case for gold and what is the case for, for Bitcoin? We heard a lot about Bitcoin, so I'm going to just uh, perhaps spend a few more minutes on gold. What we all know is that this current expansion, I'm talking about the US economic expansion, is by now, and this is outdated a little bit already, by now the longest in the history of uh, the United States. So uh, that's that's just, uh, I think, something worth mentioned it, mentioning. But very interestingly is, and I think we are not ex exaggerating when we say it's fueled by a tsunami of debt. The public debt is, and also this figure is uh, difficult to keep uh, accurate by now because we are, I think, approaching 23.5 trillion already. So it's 23 trillion uh, the, the public debt, and that doesn't include all the, uh, the other liabilities of, of, of the United States. And I think what's remarkable about this is uh, this apparently very uh, vibrant economy was, uh, is, is, is now working with a def deficit of 5 to 6% per annum. So usually you have actually at least a, more or less a consolidated uh, budget if you have a really good economy, but they have huge deficit during a high economy, and now since things are slowing down pretty rapidly, I think this development will be very interesting to, to see how this will develop. So I think the United States will have a more and more increasing uh, problem financing that deficit. So, so 
what should we do? Where should we invest? We have a huge, uh, I think, uh, asset bubble, one could say that. We, we definitely talk about the everything bubble, so financial assets have been performing extraordinarily well. Um, and so this would be in it of itself, uh, I think, a good starting point to think about gold. But what I also want to tell you is wh why invest in gold? So this is something very basic, but a lot of the people, gold is a quite emotional topic oftentimes in, in, among the asset management community. Uh, I think one should have a clear mind about what uh, is conceptually the case for gold, because the biggest problem and the biggest argument against gold is it's not paying any interest. And that's a true statement. Gold does not pay interest. So why should I invest in a non-productive asset which doesn't pay interest? So I think one can only um, understand this if one understands the monetary system to some extent. So we have an inflationary monetary system which uh, has an annual growth um, so of fiat money which is far exceeds the annual growth of the, the global gold supply. So during the last century we had like uh, on average 7.3% growth of fiat money, this is US dollar I'm talking about, and 1.52% uh, uh, growth of the gold supply. And even more recently, since 1971 till recently, the, the, the average growth was, again, 1.5%. This is a very constant figure with gold, always plus minus 1.5% versus a whooping almost 10%. So this is, I think, the basic uh, graph to understand why gold rises. Gold shouldn't get more valuable really, if fiat money wouldn't be permanently inflated. So in reality, the way I see it and the way many people see it is actually it's a devaluation of fiat money relative to a more constant yardstick, a, a more constant measuring stick. And so I think actually also for, for getting some kind of a long-term uh, performance estimate, how, how much can gold perform, it's actually as simple as that. Subtract, uh, subtracting these two numbers. So the gold uh, price in the long term basically discounts the fiat money inflation. So we have 10% fiat money inflation, 1.5% gold uh, inflation. Uh, so you can perhaps roughly estimate uh, a performance of 8.5%, which actually matches historic numbers pretty well. So this is important to understand and that's why it, there is absolutely a case to also invest in a non-interest uh, paying asset because it's uh, appreciating with, with basically with the inflation, generally speaking. But now we're talking a little bit perhaps uh, about the situation right now. So what can be viewed, and it also came up today in this uh, conference already, central banks are increasing their allocations of gold, pretty rapidly actually. This all started in 2008, uh, so we were on a, on, a, on a secular decline of gold reserves. I think for 26 consecutive years, gold reserves were actually reduced from central banks, and 2008, obviously a very important year in financial history, um, marked the, 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 this uh, point, this change in this dynamic. And it is very much fueled uh, by rest of the world. We, we uh, um, summed up here different groups of, of countries. So actually the developed markets uh, haven't uh, increased their gold allocations hugely yet but also some, some indications show us that uh, more and more developed uh, central banks from so-called developed countries uh, are starting to think about or even increasing their allocations, but most of this part was basically um, uh, increased by Russia, China, Turkey, India, so a lot of these countries uh, start, started to, to, to uh, increase their gold reserves and there is no end in sight. Just a small graphic display, I really like that, but it's a few years old. So I actually scribbled uh, around here so we actually can perhaps zoom into this. 
So this is, is uh, the stacks of the central banks. If you really uh, like put all the gold highly in highly dense, uh, densely uh, formed bars together, you see a few people down there standing around. It's, 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 it's a really... Um, Actually, it doesn't take up a lot of space. It, it, it's, it's, it's a really valuable met metal. Russia, China, you see these uh, red lines, which I tried to scribble around here, uh, have increased, have actually doubled their uh, gold reserves in uh, not even five years. So this is really a remarkable development. Russia is uh, buying, I think, 12 to 15 tons each month. Uh, regardless of the price, so they are doing a cost average program into gold, quite smart, I think. Um, so uh, China is not as transparent as Russia, so the official number is close to 2,000 tons, but uh, still increasing the gold uh, reserves rapidly. So I think just from monitoring this development, I think it's quite interesting to see, okay, central bankers are probably most of the time, not stupid people. They uh, are preparing for something. And this is not a conspiracy theory. That's also based on their own statements. So, for instance, Hungary uh, increased their um, gold reserves recently, and Poland, and even the Central Bank of uh, Netherlands uh, recently put out a, a, a statement why they are doing that because of uh, gold being basically the ultimate currency. It doesn't have any counterparty risk and it is basically a hedge for potential uh, reform of the monetary system. So we heard a lot about, of this, uh, about the stock-to-flow ratio and we actually write, have been writing about the stock-to-flow ratio for many, many years, uh, long before it became cool. <laughs> so it became cool uh, pretty fast last year since this model came up, which I'm uh, also interested in. But uh, generally speaking, I tried to, what we put uh, on this graph is I, I wanted to show this a little bit in a different way. Just from a stock-to-flow ratio perspective, um, and this is often brought up from the Bitcoin side as argument being a superior money, a more harder money than gold, um, the stock-to-flow ratio increasingly falls. What I put, uh, put on here is basically the, total, the development of the total uh, supply of gold. So that's the right-hand scale. So we currently are close to 200,000 tons of gold, which have been produced since the history of humanity. Um, and something close to 19 million, can that be, bitcoins um, on, on the bitcoin side. So the golden line, the gold supply rises very constantly. This is the 1.5%, which I referred to previously. A Bitcoin line rises uh, more and more flatter. So this is the falling stock to flow ratio, which is depicted in a little bit of a different way. Um, both are very hard monies, but, but, but this is basically the, the, the difference between gold and Bitcoin on an absolute uh, to, uh, amount scale. And this, I think it's a good argument for, in favor of Bitcoin, but it's, it's, it, it shouldn't be the only argument. So there are a lot of difference and I will, differences, and I will just briefly touch a few of them, but, but I think this is, this is important to keep in mind. Talking about Bitcoin now, shortly. So I think we heard also a lot of interesting opinions regarding Bitcoin. Should it be, it, will it be money? Is it already money? Uh, has, it some, has it got some characteristics of money already or in the future? I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to be more conservative now and I'm going to stick to the traditional digital gold argument. I think that's a, a good argument because we can so far already see Bitcoin is being used as a store of value. It's maybe a very speculative store of value, but uh, if it is a, a global store of value, if it is the global digital gold, 
I think this has a, a natural tendency to become a, a monopoly. So one actually, I think, from an investment point of view, has to make sure that one invests in, 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 in the digital gold, basically. So, so why is this version of Bitcoin so interesting? I think this is a very interesting question to, 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 to think about. There are probably different answers, and I, also, I know there are different opinions, um, but I, I guess on this conference I'm, I'm pretty safe to make the argument for, for, for the traditional Bitcoin. Uh, but I think that the strongest argument in my view is, is basically security. Call it censorship resistance, call it decentralization, call, call it hash rate, whatever you want. But Bitcoin is the strongest net, uh, network by far. Uh, of, of them all. So that makes the, the big case for, for, for Bitcoin being the digital gold, right? So I think that's an important point, and we also had this already uh, during the, uh, this conference. You can make a fork, uh, but it, the fork won't be safe. That's basically uh, pretty much in a nutshell. Putting things into perspective, so we have a huge... Um, Asset, I'd, I'd say overvaluation at least, perhaps asset bubble. Um, so these, these different areas um, represent different asset classes, and I'm sure this is too small to read, but, but just to, th to put things into perspective, gold is, is down here, silver is down there, and Bitcoin is down here. Yeah? This is a tiny, tiny slice of, of, of global uh, assets. Uh, so uh, the potential here is, is, is clearly high, obviously, especially for, for Bitcoin. Um, this is basically a different way to show uh, the proportion of Bitcoin and gold. Um, Gold, obviously, is also a moving target. Market capitalization recently um, exceeded $10 trillion, um, whereas Bitcoin still is around about $0.15 trillion. So you, you, you barely can see the Bitcoin market cap on, on this graph. So if Bitcoin does become digital gold or some kind of a version of a digital gold, there is an extreme optionality in Bitcoin. I think this argument is, is, is well known, is well explored, but I think it is very sound. And that's why uh, I, I want to emphasize this here as well. So one has two different assets, obviously, um, whereas one is very well established and one has also, talking about gold now, uh, a volatility which is uh, about roughly 15 to 20 uh, if you take uh, volatility in terms of standard deviation. Bitcoin, <laughs> on the other hand, has a much higher volatility, but it has a huge optionality. So, I'm going to talk about the characteristics uh, in, 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 in one second still. So, this potentially could be the path to digital gold. I'm not talking about even about uh, Bitcoin being a money, global money, but the path to digital gold is extremely valuable. So this, this slide I shared, uh, I took from, from Plan B, uh, from this um, model, this well-known model by now. Um, so these price swings are very wild. So this is a logarithmic scale, and the path to digital gold is extremely volatile. Um, it has been so far, and to my, in my mind, there is no reason to, to believe it will become significantly less volatile in the next months and in the next years. So this, again, actually I think is more evidence for the asymmetry of Bitcoin. So you see the monthly returns of gold, which are pretty narrow. Um, and you see the monthly returns of bitcoins, which are skewed to the right, which is an important point, which shows this asymmetry again in, in an empiric form. So one has one asymmetric uh, asset and one more or less symmetric asset, one low volatility asset and one high volatility asset. So the great challenge, and now it gets interesting in my mind, the great challenge is if you wanna, if you wanna invest in Bitcoin, how do you go about it? Yeah. So 
people are smiling already. Guys tweets, I wish I had kept my 1,700 bitcoins at 6 cents instead of selling them at 30 cents. Now they are $8. Yeah. This is a, <laughs> a funny story, but that's actually one of the better stories because this guy came out with a profit. I, I'm of the opinion that most of the people actually who, who started investing in cryptos didn't get out with a profit. Why? One of the reasons is because it's highly volatile. And because of this, uh, it has extreme uh, behavioral finance traps with, coming with it. So the great challenge is when to buy and when to sell. So Bitcoin's volatility is a curse. Who, who would agree with this statement? Some of you, okay. Bitcoin volatility is a blessing. <laughs> More agreement, okay, that's good, that's very good. Because that's one fundamental message that I want to deliver to you today. Bitcoin volatility is a blessing, at least it can be a blessing, if one does some very simple and prudent investment strategies, which I'm now going to talk about. So, one can obviously combine different assets, but since we have similar assets, we've been looking at combining gold, physical gold, and digital gold. What's, whoops, okay, something with the format didn't work out here. Doesn't matter. What, what this is, is this is classic um, uh, capital asset pricing model and uh, diversification. If you have like different assets, your, your volatility is reduced and you can actually increase uh, your, um, your return. So what, what we did is we ran through, this is obviously a historic um, um, calculation, but we ran through all the potential different portfolios, starting from 1% Bitcoin, 99% gold, and going to 99% Bitcoin, 1% gold. And since these two assets so far are not correlated, one has diversification benefits. So this is, this is something everybody from the asset management industry knows. That's, that's nothing hugely new so far. So now it's getting, interest, get, it's getting interesting. What can you do if you decide to combine Bitcoin with another asset? And, and the buzzword here is rebalancing. So what is rebalancing? I'm putting this, this blunt statement out here. HODL is not the best investment strategy. Uh, so uh, I, I really do think this, especially from, from a risk-adjusted uh, uh, return perspective. What happens, I, I am not the guy telling you that I know if Bitcoin is going to rise or fall. I just don't know. But what I am very convinced of is it will stay volatile. And this volatility, this blessing, I want to use. And it's actually pretty sim simple how one can actually use it. So one thing is, I'm not talking about this on the slide, but one very easy thing is uh, dollar cost averaging. So if you, if you dollar cost average, then, then you use the volatility because you, you save the same amount of dollars each month and you get basically a better price, entry price than you would have get, gotten if you put all your money at once in, into these assets. But if you, if you if you, do, if you have a lump sum to invest, when do you invest your lump sum? Nobody can answer you this, this, this question seriously. So I think this is always a good thing to, to basically diversify uh, your, your entry point via time. But once you diversify two assets, a low volatility asset like gold with a high volatility asset like Bitcoin, and do a permanent and disciplined, disciplined uh, rebalancing strategy, this leads you to basically permanently sell Bitcoin once it rises too sharply and, and rebalance into the low volatility asset, which is gold, and you, 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 you reinvest once uh, the Bitcoin price falls. So you, on average, you permanently are uh, increasing or you, you actually always are um, having a better entry point. So, so you're permanently working on averaging in and averaging out uh, from basically just by using the volatility. So in this case, what, 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 what this, this is a random approach. One can do it with, with different figures. It basically always works. But in, in, in this case, 
the, the strategic allocation would be 25%, this is on the left scale, uh, of, of Bitcoin, and 75% gold. And a sale is triggered if the portfolio weight of, of crypto, of Bitcoin, exceeds 40%. And a buy is triggered if the weight of crypto uh, is smaller than 10%. So this is mainly triggered by the volatility of, of Bitcoin. It's also to a small extent triggered by the volatility of gold, of course, because gold also has, has movements, but, but, but really not, uh, not, 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 not mentionable almost uh, relative to Bitcoin volatility. So what happens is if Bitcoin rallies, your allocation automatically increases and you, you sell it at, at a specific trigger. In this case, w once you have 40%. So basically, you could say, whenever Bitcoin doubles in price, I take half the profits and reinvest in gold. Whenever it falls 50%, uh, I take some of the gold and put it back into, into Bitcoin. And it is really that easy. Um, it, it works brilliantly, so that, 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 is, that is something everybody can actually do by himself. I am personally doubtful that a lot of people will do it themselves, because in my experience, people really always have the tendency to start trading, and, and it's really often quite difficult to actually sell into strengths, because when, when, when is the strength? Strength is when everybody's talking about it. Strength is when, when people get greedy. Strength is when you have great news around. Uh, and, and then you think, well, now that, I don't know what has to happen, China has allowed Bitcoin as official currency. Don't think that that will happen so soon. But whatever happens and just is now discussed in the market uh, will probably lead you to not do the sale right now. You probably want to stay in the market a little bit longer. So it, it's, it's really difficult to do it, but one can do it. One can do it by oneself. So I would propose anybody to, uh, which, who, who wants to invest a part of their money to, to do a very disciplined uh, rebalancing strategy, definitely. It doesn't have to be with gold. I think it's very suitable with gold. It can, can, can be with, uh, with, with fiat or with bonds if you really want to invest in bonds, whatever. Whatever you think is not so risky, you know. Um, and so we did, we did, really, we crunched the numbers, we did all combinations, we did uh, different rebalancing uh, triggers, and it really is a systemic increase. So what this is, is the sharp ratio of all different portfolio combinations. And you have a structural, basically a structural increase of your sharp ratios, um, and this works Generally, the better, the higher you have these uh, rebalancing bands. So if you give Bitcoin more lee leeway to move, then you have actually, you can increase your Sharpe ratio even, even higher. The problem, in my view, uh, from an asset management point of view at least, is if, if you have a portfolio in an extreme version, you have zero to 100% Bitcoin, um, it's difficult to know what kind of volatility you're talking about. So that's why we are actually looking at, at this version, which I just showed you, 25%, 75%, and maximum 40 and minimum 10. So, so you roughly know in what kind of a category of volatility you always, you always are. Um, but, but, but just from, from the statistics point of view, you would actually have to even increase these, these bandwidths to, 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 to optimize it. So this is some, something everybody can do by oneself, the rebalancing strategy. On top, and this is more or less the final uh, part I'm going to tell you here, but uh, since I think a few perhaps more sophisticated or professional investors are in this room, uh, I'm going to touch it briefly on top. And this <laughs> is, is really, uh, I, I'm fascinated about this. On top, you can basically use option, uh, option writing strategy to create income. You actually can use volatility to create uh, cash if you have this kind of, uh, a cash flow if you have this kind of portfolio. How do you do that? So in this case, let's stick to this case, you have 25% Bitcoin. And you have 75% um, gold. You can write options because since 
since January, I think, 13th, there is an option market on, uh, on the Bitcoin future, although, but still, uh, economically, it's just the same. You can write a call option for the case that your exposure actually does rise and for the case that you actually want to reduce your exposure. So you write a call, you receive a premium, and if, if you are exercised in the call, it's exactly what you want to do anyway, because you want to reduce your uh, exposure into strength, and you know roughly where, where the trigger will, will be, and that's why you can p pick a strike price when you have reached your, your, your trigger uh, allocation of Bitcoin. And the same you can do on the downside. If you want to ex uh, have to increase your uh, uh, e exposure, you write the put. And what's so charming and what's so fascinating for me as an asset manager with this simple add-on strategy is the premiums for these options are just really attractive, really attractive. O obviously, because Bitcoin is such a high volatility asset, so you can really uh, receive a lot of money uh, selling uh, basically insurance, that's what, you, what it is. You're selling insurance, you're selling put options, you're selling call options, which would be a highly risky thing to do if you wouldn't have the underlying. But you do have the underlying and you want to make the trade. You want to reduce into strengths and you want to buy into weakness. So you use the volatility on a different level, on a derivative level, on top of that, and, and you can create, depending on the strategy, how you calibrate it, but you can, you can create uh, double-digit cash flows if, if you do this in a structural way. So this is also, I think, something which is very interesting. It has its limits. It has its limits from a capacity point of view because the option market currently is very young, so it's not hugely liquid yet. So one can, this, can do this only with a, 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 a limited amounts of assets under management. So this is uh, like a little bit of like a hedge fund strategy at the end of the day, a very conservative hedge fund strategy, uh, which, which uses uh, volatility from the option markets. So. This is, this is all I'm going to take, uh, tell you about this option strategy because I don't want to go too much into detail, but I just wanted to perhaps pick your brains with this and uh, share my enthusiasm for, for, for this strategy. Yeah, so I'm getting to my conclusions, which are, one, gold is the store value with the longest track record and long-term protection against the dilution of fiat money. I think this is something which, which is very clear. Bitcoin is a highly speculative digital store of value with an attractive, asymmetric, optional, and I would say binary payout profile. What do I mean by binary? I do think there are risks involved, systematic risks involved in Bitcoin. I would not 100% rule out the the probability, the possibility that Bitcoin goes to zero. It could happen. I, I don't think it's a high probability, but it is. Uh, I, I would rule out the possibility that gold goes to zero. So it is a different asset, yeah? but it is highly asymmetric. It is highly asymmetric and the upside is, is, is huge. The combination of gold and cryptocurrencies results in an excellent risk return ratio and it very importantly, protects against the psychological timing errors, which I think are always involved in high volatility assets. Volatility can be used to the investor's advantage via a rule-based rebalancing strategy. I hope I brought uh, that point to you. And professional investors can take advantage of high volatility and create regular cash flows by a systematic option writing uh, by, by systematic option writing. So these uh, points I hope I could uh, deliver and hope to answer more questions now or later, but thanks for, for your time and thanks for this conference. Do we have questions from the audience? Um, because... Um, I would like, I have a question, and actually, is there, uh, is this a Bitcoin only, or you said it's a, it's a crypto fund, so do you add other altcoins for, in, 
like with, with uh, interesting profiles yeah. or whatever? Well, in our investment strategy, uh, we explicitly do not only talk about Bitcoin. Why do we do that? Because um, I uh, don't think that Bitcoin can be challenged personally, mm -hmm. but I also don't want to rule it out 100%. So what we do uh, is we look at basically the market cap, the liquidity and so on of store of value in uh, coins. Mm -hmm. And if some potential competitor could, should come up, we, we then take that into the portfolio if it, it, if it gets a significant market cap. But right now we, we don't see that at all. So currently this is Bitcoin only. Very good. And from a custody point of view, um, do you, where do you trade and where you custody your, 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 your gold and your Bitcoin? Um, custody is uh, possible in, in Liechtenstein via cold storage. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we also use uh, futures though and to, to you know, able to be uh, in, implementing the option strategies. So mostly cold storage, a little bit of, of derivatives. Very good. And is there a certain limit to the fund size? Or yes. What is it, what yes. Is it? It's difficult to estimate. I mean, um, uh, currently I'd say 100 million or so, so it's, it's really not huge. But, but as things are so dynamic, um, obviously if, if, if markets get more, more liquid, which, which I would expect, the limit uh, would, would also increase. Okay, so you're raising up to 100 million at the moment and then you're looking... At well, I mean... People have to have to get accustomed. I think the traditional investors have to get accustomed to to this asset class. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good strategy to enter this asset class if you haven't been in there yet. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 100 million is is a nice target, but it's 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 not not uh, not uh, in front of the doorstep yet. So okay, perfect. <laughs> um, any more questions? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a question. Okay.